Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Malik Yawm Adin, Iyaka na'abadu wa Iyaka nasta'in, Ihtina Sirat al-Mustakeen, Sirat Sirat al-Ladina al-Amta alayhim, Ghayr maghdubi alayhim, Walla ta'alim. A few years ago, I was riding on a crowded subway in Cairo. There was a young man sitting near me quietly reciting the Quran. He had one of these small pocket versions, which means that either he had supernatural eyesight or that he had memorized much of the text and was just following along to make sure he didn't make any mistakes as he should. What was most impressive was that all of those standing around him moved away a bit as much as they could in the jam of the subway car, creating a small space around him. They lowered their voices. Though the subway was very congested, here was this open space occupied only by the whispering of the words of God. I was on my way to spend some time with a friend who had volunteered to teach me some of the rudiments of recitation. When I got to her house, we would always spend some time talking about theology and practice and family life and so forth. Then came the time to read Quran and I would perform the wudu and then we would sit formally at the table to read a page, sorting through all those odd squiggles and slash marks and circles to decipher the pronice, precise pronunciations and then trying to make my mouth do things it was never designed to do. There was a very large Quran on a stand in the living room. At one point, Salma discovered that there was a small pencil notation in the margin and she was shocked. And it turned out that it was her mother who had written a note on a particular passage in the margin as a clarification from a sheikh, and she did not want to forget it. The reverence for the Quran requires that one make space and quiet for its recitation, that its pages be kept clean and clear, and that its recitation be precise. One is in a sense trying to reproduce without change or flaw, the original speech that came to Muhammad, peace be upon him. It should not be necessary to ask why this should be true. This is after all a dictation from God. But I am an overeducated academic and we're paid to ask questions. And anyways, I'm curious in general about what it is that makes things holy? And what does it mean to be holy? Are we ourselves to be holy, to lead holy lives? How does that work? There are two verses in the Quran that help me think about this. The first is in Surah Al-Ma'ada. In verse 82, we read about a group of Christians, some of whom are priests, kisisin, and others of whom are ascetics or monks, Ruhman. Some believe the priests were scholars as well. They're supposed to be educated. But it gets really interesting in the next verse. These priests and monks listen to the revelation, the Quran, and their eyes start watering and their tears flow down their cheeks because they recognize truth in what they hear. We don't know what verses were recited to them, but whatever they were, they could see the truth of it. And their response was overwhelming. As well as the tears, they cried out, we believe, write us down as among the witnesses, the shahideen. And some interpret this as a conversion story, but it's not. They are Christians who recognize in the Quran a truth that being holy men, they already knew. They did not learn the truth from what they heard. They recognized it. Arafu min al-haq. 
there are plenty of stories about people hearing the recitation of the Quran and being converted. One of the most notable is the story of Omar in the Sira. He learned that his sister had converted and he was incensed. He stormed into her home and demanded her confession and noting that she was trying to hide a piece of paper, he demanded that she read. It was apparently a, a portion of Surat al -Taha. She recited it or someone else did and he too was moved to tears and he converted. I think there is a natural tendency to make every story of overwhelming response by someone who is not Muslim, a conversion story, but it is not so here, which is really what makes it all the more remarkable. What I find so astonishing here is not that they recognize truth in the Quran, but that it moved them to tears. How often do we get moved to tears when we hear the Quran? How often does some truth, some aha moment, rock us back on our heels, open a window and shine some light, blazing light into a dark corner? I have to say, I have to work at that. I can read through the Quran and the words slip by smoothly and effortlessly and it's soothing usually a good reminder of things that I know, what I should be doing, what I should not be doing. And all of that is worthwhile. It is recognition. But I always carry a sneaky suspicion, perhaps a guilty knowledge, that when I am reading sacred scripture, I ought to be wearing a crash helmet and seat belts. Tears. Perhaps it was because they were priests and monks that they were more deeply immersed in that scriptural worldview that such deep truths struck so forcefully with passionate potency. I don't know. Tears, tears. The passage is addressed to some hearers, to Muhammad certainly, and through Muhammad to others. The text does not actually just say that the priests and monks wept when they heard the Quran, but you will see them weep. They are a testimony to those original hearers and, and to all of us that the Quran has this capability, this power. One might imagine that perhaps those Muslims to whom God was addressing at that moment might have been treating the Quran a little bit too casually with a little too much familiarity. And God says, look at them, they're Christian, Christian. And look at what the Quran does to them. Don't get too comfortable with the Quran. So the truth of the Quran, the truth in the Quran can perhaps should bring us to tears. Perhaps not every time, but many times. Perhaps just in case we should always wear our seatbelts. There is another passage which seems to fit with this idea and expand it a bit in a different way. The Quran records in Surat al Zumar God has sent down the most beautiful of all teachings, a scripture that is consistent and draws comparisons, that causes the skins of those in awe of their Lord to shiver. Then their skins and their hearts soften at the mention of God. What wonderful imagery. Here again, the response to the hearing of the Quran is visceral. They shiver from it. Their skin puckers up and tingles. They get goosebumps. Their hearts race. But then gradually they relax a bit. The skin softens and the heart slows to a steady beat. They remember the guidance, the huda of God. What is it that causes such a response? What is it about the, the holiness of what is happening that gives such a profound reaction? There is no mention of recognition of truth in this particular passage, though, of course, that could not be absent. 
The word here that I find so magical is ahsan. Allahu nazala ahsan al-hadith. God has sent down the most beautiful of reports. A kitab mutashabiha mathan. I, I don't really know what that means. I don't think anybody does. I've read a lot of interpretations and commentaries, none of which seem to have really nailed it. My conclusion is that it means it is a book that gives a coherent message in many different ways, but who knows? But I want to focus on the ihsan of the Quran. The root ha sin nun means good or moral. That's the way it's most commonly used in the Quran. But it could also mean in the superlative, the best, as in making the best of choices. And it can mean beautiful. In Surah Qughafar, we read, he created the heavens and the earth with truth, bilhaq, and he formed you and made you beautiful, ahsana, in your form. And God, God is also beautiful. A famous hadith says, God is beautiful and loves beauty. This doesn't speak of God's appearance, of course. It speaks of God's nature, the nature of God's being. Some of that is revealed to mortals like that, but much is far beyond our capables to, capabilities to perceive. But all is beautiful. God is beautiful. And God is the best of creators, the most beautiful of creators. God can create the seen and the unseen, the possible and the impossible. God creates it all in a beautiful way because God loves beauty. God is described by the, the beautiful names, al-Asmar al-Husna. They're all beautiful because God is beautiful. God cannot be or do that which is not beautiful. We know, of course, that Ihsan is important because of the famous Hadith of Gabriel. When Imam and Nawawi collected his small uh, volume, his Arbi'in, of the 40 most important narrations of the prophet, he put this one second. Let me summarize it like this. A mysterious stranger came to Muhammad and he sat down right in front of him, knee to knee, and he put his hands on Muhammad's knees and the companions are astonished by this. Who is this guy? The man said to Muhammad, tell me about Islam. Muhammad answered uh, by reciting the five pillars. The stranger said, you are right. And the, the Companions are pretty astonished at this. Now tell me about Iman. Muhammad gave the elements of the Aqidah to believe in God, God's angels, God's books, God's messengers, the last day and divine destiny. And again, the stranger approved of his answer. The third question was, tell me about Ihsan. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, it is to worship God as though you are seeing him. And while you see him not, yet truly he sees you. The stranger asked further about the hour and the signs and then left. It was then that Muhammad revealed that the stranger was none but the angel Gabriel, come to teach us our religion. This trio of Islam, Iman, and Ihsan are often taken to be, together, the summation of the Islamic reality. The first two have to do with the rituals and the beliefs of Islam. The third really has to do with our encounter with God. Not what we do, not what we believe, but who we are, who we are in our relationship to God. It's worship as relationship. Khalid Abu al-Fadl talks about Sharia as the way, the path to beauty. It is the search for beauty, the path that we seek to find and to follow. 
Sharia, which is the practice and the rituals and the beliefs of Islam, is the sign of God, he says, and the promise of God, necessary because of our imperfections. God's beauty is the confirmation of the beauty by which and in which God has created us. The nature of the most essential encounter with God is Ihsan, the meadow of beauty. Our very creation as human beings is an act of beauty making. And our response must be beauty being. Many years ago, decades if the truth be told, I was on a committee with a young Native American woman. Whenever we would part to go our separate ways, she would say, walk in beauty. That has stayed with me ever since. It is so profound. I've pondered, what does it mean to walk in beauty? It is the most profound statement of what it means to be human to be a creature fashioned by God in a beautiful way and to live and act and be that way. The woman whose name I've long forgotten was probably Navajo because the phrase is from the blessing way of the Navajo. The closing prayer of that ceremony includes these words, in beauty I walk, with beauty before me I walk, with beauty behind me I walk. With beauty above me, I walk. With beauty around me, I walk. It has become beauty again. I've not found these words in the Quran, but the message is there. Beauty is in the world around us, before, behind, above, beneath, and all around. There certainly is much ugliness in the world, much that is ungainly, but in the blessing way, there is beauty even in that. Nothing is without beauty. And the way of blessing is to see it as if we walk that path in our daily lives. To see it as we walk. God is beautiful and loves beauty. It is also a beauty within. One cannot recognize the beauty without, absent the beauty within. One must be, aspire to be, be mindful to be a beautiful person. So what does it mean to be a beautiful person? When we put it like that, it becomes clear that we're not talking simply about physical beauty or not only about physical beauty. Physical beauty is overrated. Look at our icons of beauty, those models who model clothing. Do any of them ever look happy? Occasionally I look through the style section and it strikes me that all of these models look unhappy or bored or even annoyed. None of them seems to be enjoying themselves or the clothes that they're wearing. Are these the wages of beauty? No, when we speak of a beautiful person, we're talking of, about a constellation of characteristics grace, harmony, wisdom, naturalness, openness, acceptance. The beautiful person invites us into a circle of beauty, a circle of love and joy and peace. We are usually, unfortunately, not spiritually adept at hearing God whispering in our ears, I have made you beautiful. The world around us will often see and say ugliness. And so we say it ourselves, but we have it on the authority of God. You are beautifully made, you are beautiful. So beauty is around us and beauty is within us and thereby we must walk. Beauty is not just a way of being, it is a way of moving through the world. It is a way of interacting in time and space with people and things. It is a way of doing, a way of acting. Beauty creates beauty and receives beauty in return. All this brings me back to the beginning, to that young man on the subway 
quietly reciting from the Quran. Everyone knew that they had to acknowledge the holiness of what was happening there and give it space. They made space for beauty, for the possibilities of tears and goosebumps, for the possibility that the mere presence of these words and thus the primordial speaker of those words was present in that space. That speaker, God, is beautiful. And what makes that space holy is the beauty of God. The question that I leave with you and with myself is, how do I make space in my life for beauty, for Ihsan? How will I walk in beauty today? How today can I be a beautiful person? For thus we are commissioned to walk in beauty because God is beautiful and loves beauty. Thank you.